You know, I have an uncle. I love him dearly, but he loves to make fun of me in my job. He often comes up to me and says, you know, Eric, you have the best job ever. You can be wrong half the time and still keep your job. My response to him is often, well, one, I'm not wrong half the time. And I say, two, you know what? You try predicting the future behavior of a nonlinear chaotic fluid. See how you do. You see, that's what we do as meteorologists. So I put up here, the next time you complain about a meteorologist being wrong, I want you to think back about the last time we had the NCAA tournament and think about your bracket. Think about how tens of millions of people participate in this, filling out a bracket just like this, where they have at their disposal over 2,000 games, 20,000 player statistics, along with the history of every program. Yet nobody has predicted a perfect bracket. This is my bracket from the 2018 uh, uh, you know, men's NCAA basketball uh, bracket. I picked University of Virginia to win the whole thing. They lost in the first round. Uh, so it just goes to show you how difficult it is to predict nonlinear chaotic systems, and that's what our atmosphere is. Now, if you need to understand nonlinearity and chaos, let me just take you to this tweet put out by, um, by ESPN. So I got permission to use this one from, from them. This is from the 2017 Super Bowl. So it was uh, New England versus Atlanta. Now, in that game, there was at one point at the start of the third quarter that Atlanta, according to the statisticians here, was had a 98.9% chance of winning the Super Bowl. Do you want to know what nonlinearity and chaos is in football? It has a name. The name is Tom Brady. You see, Tom Brady's of the atmosphere are hurricanes. They're El Ninos. They are massive disruptions that can change everything. And that's what we have to study, okay? Now, if you're relying on this animal for your long-range weather prediction, I'm hopefully going to give you a little bit different solution today. The groundhog. We've been pulling the groundhog out of its cage uh, for 130 years asking its opinion about the weather. And please, please, please do not trust the groundhog's forecast. For example, they predicted six more weeks of winter in 2018. And while it was valid for some locations, it was not valid for others. This is just a fun little gimmick, something that that people do. This animal, as I've written, has no predictive skill. Okay? We've tested it. Noah did a study. Turns out, over the 130 years that we've been yanking this creature, which should be hibernating in February, okay, yanked it out of a cage and asked it its opinion about weather, well, it turns out that it's been right only 38% of the time. Now, if you understand anything about simple probability and statistics, you've probably heard about flipping a coin. You flip a coin 130 times, you'll get about 50, or, you know, 50% of the time you'll get heads and 50% you'll get tails. You do better flipping a coin, guessing the weather than trusting the groundhog. Oh, and by the way, don't trust the woolly worm forecast. You ever heard of this one? Turns out people will look at the color of the banding on these fuzzy worms, caterpillars, I don't know what they are, and try to predict the upcoming winter severity based upon it. This is a load of garbage. Or they'll cut open persimmon seeds and look to see if the shape of the internal part of the seed looks like a fork, a spoon, or a knife. They all look the same to me, but whatever. And from that, try to predict the long-range weather forecast. This, none of these things work, but people like to use this. I'm going to tell you a quick story. There was a TV meteorologist that used to have all of her... Um, all of her viewers go out and collect woolly worms and take pictures of them and send them to her. And then she would analyze, she would analyze all of them and she'd say, okay, we've got the official woolly worm forecast coming up for this winter. And she was a weather forecaster in central Illinois. And I loved her to death. Great woman. But this is not how we do forecasting. So she would get all the viewers to send in pictures of woolly worms and she'd say, okay, well, this upcoming uh, winter, we're expecting it to look like this because... Well, the woolly worms were, well, a lot of them were black, or a lot of them have brown stripes on them, or a lot of them were white. She says, because of that, you know, this upcoming winter, I'm expecting in Illinois to have bouts of really, really cold air followed by warm-ups. We're going to have sleet. We're going to have freezing rain. We're going to have snow. It's going to be a tough winter. And I would look at her and i go, well, wait a minute. You, you just described the entire spectrum of weather possibilities in Illinois. And this is brilliant. She's never wrong. Because of that, think about it. If you give everybody all possibilities, well, you told them it was one of those possibilities, you got it right. But that's not how we do weather forecasting. We also don't do it using this. That's me taking a picture of, a few years ago, the Farmer's Almanac. You see, the Farmer's Almanac for the winter of 2013-14 called for Champaign, this area, to be mild and dry, very next to cold and snowy, mild and wet, cold and dry, cold and... How in the world did they do this? I have no idea. 
Then they called for summer 2014 to be hot and dry. So mild dry winter, hot dry summer. Let's see how well the Farmer's Almanac did. Well, what did our winter look like? We had the ninth coldest on record. They said it was going to be mild and dry. Ninth coldest on record. They said summer was going to be, remember, hot and dry. But I guess with a nearby raindrop, I don't understand that. Hot and dry. What did we have? Our 112th wettest on record and one of our coolest Julys on record. So don't rely on the Farmer's Almanac. What do you rely on? You rely on the research of this man. He is someone who started us in the full understanding of the three-dimensional teleconnected flow of the atmosphere. Now, what does that mean? Teleconnected. It means it's all connected. What happens to the weather in one place shows up in another. This is Carl Gustav Rossby. And a contemporary of his, Edward Lorenz, well, both of them helped understand a concept called chaos theory or the butterfly effect. Now, the butterfly effect, which kind of gets its it, it, origins here in weather, says that if a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, it might cause a blizzard uh, in Russia or a hurricane to blow up in the Atlantic. You see, the idea is small perturbations, small changes can have lasting downstream effects. What did Carl study, Carl Rossby study? Well, he studied what are called Rossby waves, these big wave-like motions in the flow of the atmosphere, because he knew that the presence of troughs and ridges, that's where ridges where it bulges north, troughs where it dips to the south, he knew that these were the dominant weather features of our weather patterns. He also knew that because the atmosphere is chaotic and is nonlinear in its behavior, that small perturbations, small changes can change everything. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Here's an example. You have this small little island sticking up into this cloud field, this stratocumulus cloud field in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And it creates this long downstream perturbation, this change that can stretch for miles. You see, this little feature disrupted the whole flow of the atmosphere. And that's what we're going to study today. But we're not going to study a little feature. We're going to study a massive feature that can disrupt, disrupt the flow of the atmosphere. And we call it El Nino. And here is the history of it. You see, who got credit for naming El Nino was Peruvian fishermen. And I got this great picture over here showing you some reed boats that are used all over the world, but these are ones from Peru, where they would go out and they'd fish the very cold, nutrient-rich waters off the coast of Peru. So now where's Peru? Well, you're looking at a map of South America, and Peru is right here. And all along the coast, right in through here, there's very, very cold water. And what's in them? Peruvian anchovies. And these anchovies, well, they grind them up and they make them into fish meal and they sell them all over the world. There's even a secondary industry around the anchovy because this bird called a gannet or a booby, this is actually a blue-footed booby, will actually fly over the ocean, ocean and pick up these fish and eat them. Now, what's amazing is when this fish, I'm sorry, when this bird poops on these rocks, there's a separate industry in Peru that goes out and collects the bird poop. Because it turns out when that, this bird eats this fish and poops on these rocks, it's some of the best natural fertilizer on earth. Here's the problem. Every two to seven years, and yes, that's a weird time period, but every two to seven years, these really cold, nutrient-rich waters, well, they'd warm up. And when they'd warm up, the fish would leave. There's no longer the nutrients. The fish leave, the birds leave. And the problem is fishermen can't fish, bird crap collectors can't collect bird crap, and part of the Peruvian economy shuts down. Oh, and then there's this problem. Parts of Peru, which are typically very dry, have massive flooding, which means they can't farm either. And historically, this would shut down the Peruvian economy. Now, why does Peru get all the attention at the beginning? Well, it was these Peruvian fishermen who named this weather event El Nino. And El Nino should always be capitalized because unlike what we learned from the 1997 skit on Saturday Night Live, El Nino is not Spanish for the Nino, as Chris Farley interpreted for us. El Nino is Spanish for the little boy, but it's the capital little boy. It's Jesus, the Messiah of the Christian faith. They called it this because El Nino events typically reach a peak in winter around the Christian holiday of Christmas, the birth of Christ. Now, why are we studying it? Because when an El Nino happens, it's a 
big perturbation, a big change, not a butterfly flapping its wings, but instead the redistribution of ocean currents, the redistribution of ocean temperatures, and the redistribution of precipitation across nearly a quarter of the world's surface. So we got to talk about it. El Nino and its sub uh, its sister circulation, La Nina. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. Now, showing you a board here of Trivial Pursuit, because I'm going to tell you a brief story about my life, okay? When I was growing up, my best friend growing up, his name was Chaz. When we were 12 years old, I was invited over to Chaz's house. Now, I've been a nerd my whole life. I can't get away from it. When I was at Chaz's house, we were playing this game, Trivial Pursuit. Now, I helped Chaz get through school. Chaz helped me look cool. That's how our relationship worked, and it was beautiful. Best friends for the longest time, Chaz. We're there playing Trivial Pursuit, and I'm on Chaz's team with him and his dad. And we roll and land on the science puzzle piece. And this was the question. I'm going to see if you know the answer. What is the fastest spinning planet in our solar system? Everybody in Chaz's family, this is a Christmas celebration. Everybody's looking at me because they know that I helped Chaz get good grades in school. They thought I was the smart kid. I don't know. I'm just a nerd. And they look at me and they say, well, what's the answer, Eric? And I sat back and I thought about it. I'm 12 years old. You see, I remembered at that moment something my dad had taught me. You see, I remembered asking my dad, why do all of our weather systems, our storms, why do they keep coming from the West? And my dad says, well, planet Earth has wind belts. And where we live, we live in the westerly wind belts. And I said, why does Earth have wind belts? And he said, because of how, how fast Earth spins. My mind immediately went to this planet, a planet with dozens of wind belts, our gas giant, Jupiter. And when I blurted out the answer, Jupiter, we got it right. Now, how did I know this? Well, each one of these striations on Jupiter is a different wind belt. They go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And Jupiter, as it spins, and it's a massive, massive planet. You can see the giant red spot right there, a big dome of high pressure sitting in that location. As Jupiter spins, it only takes a little less than 10 hours to complete one revolution. It takes 24 for us here in the U.S. I'm sorry, in, uh, on Earth. It takes just about 10 hours in Jupiter. And got the pie puzzle piece? And... Maybe it's a reason why I study Earth's atmosphere now. This is what our atmosphere does. Check out this animation. You see, that's the flow of the jet stream. And when you look at it, where we live, where I live, I should say, here in the mid middle part of, the, of our continent here in North America, our weather patterns generally come from the west. But to our north and to our south, we have winds that come from the east. And we today want to talk about the trade winds. Now, how do they get their name? Well, merchants way over here, see the corner here from, uh, from Europe, would sail along the coast of Europe, go down to the coast of Africa, picking up goods and people, and they would catch the trade winds, watch them again, which blow from the east, remember that, from the east to the west. This would fill their sails, and they come over to South America and what they used to call the West Indies. We now call these the Lesser Antilles and the Greater Antilles. They're in the Caribbean. And they would sail up the east coast of what was then just North America uh, and then catch the westerlies back over to Europe. So this was a trade route. The westerlies blew them back. The trade winds brought them over. Here's what we're going to study today. The strength of the trade winds oscillates, and they can change, and this guy figured it out. Sir Gilbert Walker, a contemporary of Edward Lorenz, actually before Edward Lorenz, but a, a same kind of group of scientists here, was studying the Indian monsoon and discovered that the strength of those trade winds wasn't consistent. They would speed up and slow down. Sometimes they'd even reverse, and that is how El Ninos and La Ninas are born. So let's learn together. When things are normal, we're going to pay attention to the weather patterns across this stretch of ocean, the largest stretch of ocean east to west across our planet. This is the region where El Ninos and La Ninas occur. Now what happens? Well, let me draw it for you. This is the ocean right across here. So we're going to look at a three-dimensional drawing over here. Ready? The trade winds typically blow from the east to the west. Write that down, east to west. Generally, we measure higher atmospheric pressure over South America and lower atmospheric pressure over Australia and Indonesia. And what ends up happening is, is the air ascends above the low pressure and it rises and makes clouds and precipitation. And that air slams into the trouble pause and spreads out horizontally again. Yeah, some air goes, you know, off in this direction as well. But I just want to show you one complete circuit here. As the air goes across the upper levels of the atmosphere, it eventually descends 
over this area of higher atmospheric pressure, creating what's called the Walker cell. Now, what happens here, okay? Trade winds east to west rise over Australia, go back across the top of the atmosphere, here where the tropopause is, and sinks like this, making it very wet over here and dry over here. The ocean responds in kind. The ocean circulations mimic the atmospheric circulations. What ends up happening is we get upwelling of cold, nutrient-rich waters from the bottom of the ocean here and downwelling of the less nutrient-rich waters here. But normally, the warm water is pushed across the open ocean over toward Australia, leaving the cold water where all the fish live here near Peru. This is what happens when things are normal. And this is all you need to know about the basic science of an El Nino. When things are normal, the circulation goes like this. I'll just kind of draw over it. It goes something like that, right? That's the atmosphere, and there's the ocean. When there's an El Nino, that circulation slows down, it weakens, it could even stop or reverse. And you might be wondering, why does it do that? And I'm here to tell you, we don't know. We're still studying this. We're studying these massive oscillations. But let's learn what we do know. When an El Nino event occurs, which happens every two to seven years, we get a reversal of our pressure systems. Instead of having low pressure over Australia, high pressure builds there. Instead of having high pressure over Peru, low pressure builds there. And the trade winds reverse. They're no longer from the east. Remember this. They then can at times come from the west. And what does that do? That lets all the warm water, which is normally piled up over here over the west, go sloshing back across the open ocean. That redistributes the water, that redistributes the precipitation, and that changes about 10,000 miles of open ocean. And that affects weather systems everywhere. So what's the sequence of events? Well, for some reason, we're still studying this, the surface pressure systems, that being the, the high, uh, the low over Australia, the high over Peru, they weaken. That changes the direction and the speed of the trade winds. The warm water, which is normally pushed west, goes racing back to the east, and we can see it from space. Now, after an El Nino ends, we often have what's called a La Nina. Now, La Nina is not Jesus' Jesus' sister or mother or something. No, no, no. La Nina is what scientists call the opposite of El Nino. When the system tries to right itself and go back to normal, sometimes it overshoots. And when it overshoots, that circulation I just drew for you on the previous page is much stronger than normal. Remember that, much stronger than normal. Therefore, we get much, much more colder than average sea surface temperatures, and the trade winds are really strong out of the east like they normally are. So El Nino is when the thing stops and reverses. La Nina is when it goes back to normal and goes too fast, okay? El Nino, La Nina. That's it. That's all the science I want you to know about it. What we're going to spend the rest of this lecture understanding is, what are the implications? Are you ready? All right. To see a La Nina, we're looking for cold ocean temperatures right in through here. You see, here's the evolution of a La Nina. See it right there. See the cold ocean temperatures come through? That's what we're going to be paying attention to. When it's warm in here, El Nino, cold in there, La Nina. Now here are the implications. Are you ready? Hurricanes first. What I've got for you here is a list of El Nino years and La Nina years. So the El Nino years are up here on top and the La Nina years are down on bottom. Normally the Atlantic Ocean, remember the Atlantic Ocean, this is not the Pacific. The Pacific is where El Nino happens. This is the Atlantic. We'll tell you why this, there's a connection here. But normally in the Atlantic Ocean, a typical hurricane season has six hurricanes. Look at what happens when there's an El Nino. With the exception of one year, we had at or below normal hurricane activity. I'll tell you why in a second. Okay, When there's a La Nina, remember six is normal. Only one year had normal numbers. Each one of these big La Nina years was much more active than normal. Give you an example, 2015, major, major El Nino. We only had four hurricanes, 50% of the total energy from our hurricanes. Whereas that warm water from the El Nino over the Pacific made major hurricanes in the Pacific. So here's the takeaway point. When there is an El Nino event, we have fewer hurricanes in the Atlantic. When there's a La Nina event, there's more hurricanes in the Atlantic. Write that down. El Nino, less hurricanes in the Atlantic. La Nina, more hurricanes in the Atlantic. And why is that the case? 
Well, let's figure this out. 2017, a hyperactive season. Uh, we had uh, basically uh, one of the most active seasons since uh, 1851. Uh, maybe, maybe $400 billion in damages, 200% of normal accumulated energy, 17 named storms. Absolutely incredible. Why? Why did this happen? Okay. Why do we have Hurricane Harvey, Irma, Maria, all these powerful hurricanes? Well, it's all about wind shear. Go back to those hurricane lectures. Remember this? Hurricanes need low wind shear and they need warm sea surface temperatures. This is a graph showing you normal wind shear in black from January to December. Because there was a La Nina event, because there was a La Nina event, we had lower than average wind shear in the Atlantic. Now, yes, El Ninos and La Ninas happen in the Pacific, but they influence the Atlantic by changing wind shear. El Nino years have high wind shear, thus fewer hurricanes. La Nina years have lower wind shear of the Atlantic, thus more hurricanes. Replay that if you want. That's an important bullet point. So let's talk about it. Let's see what happens, though, because that's really hurricanes. What about us here in the United States? Let's talk about that. Well, El Nino and La Ninas have their biggest impact in winter, and this is because the changes in the jet stream are biggest in winter, and the jet stream is not a major player during the summer. So I'm going to show you a couple of events here, okay? We're looking here at the period of El Ninos and La Ninas with time. I want to talk to you about the winter 2015 El Nino. That's this massive one here. And I also want to talk to you about the winter of 2010-2011, El Nino, which is this one right here. And we'll also talk about the winter and fall uh, a week La Nina from 2017-2018. Ready? Here we go. What does Noah say? Well, Noah says this. Whenever there's an El Nino event, this is what we should expect. We typically expect a jet stream that's more of a straight pattern like this. California is typically wet. The southern states are typically wet. And it's very warm and dry. What does this mean for Illinois? Well, typically when there's an El Nino year, we have a warmer than average winter. Remember that. In Illinois, where I teach my class out of, we typically have a warm winter. Now, it's potentially dry, but not always. But definitely we have less snow. That's because it's warmer than average. Now, let me give you an example. This was the map showing you on January 4, 2016, the El Nino event right here. You see, this map is showing you sea surface temperature anomalies, and they are warm right in through this area, warmer than average. That's how we detect El Ninos. We look for warmer than average sea surface temperatures across the middle part of the Pacific Ocean. We measure it in four different regions across this area, Nino 4, Nino 3.4, Nino 3, and Nino 1 and 2. Those are just areas that we look at right in through this uh, region here. All of them we're showing positive anomalies. Zero is normal. The orange represents El Nino. So I don't know, I could probably just write in here L so you can see this. Anywhere we see the oranges, we're talking about El Nino. Now I know for those of you that speak Spanish, I just wrote, you know, the, but whatever. So every one of them reporting these warmer than average conditions. We can see here that those warm waters extended pretty deep uh, into, the, uh, into the ocean. Look at it again here. You can see the warm waters really deep below the ocean surface and therefore it was sustained and lasted a long time. Now what were the consequences? Well, that El Nino happened and these were the statewide minimum temperature ranks for December 15 through uh, February 2016. Notice how warm it was in this area. That's what we expect in winter from El Ninos. What was interesting though is that it wasn't dry. We we're actually quite wet through a big section of the country. But we were not getting snow. Look at this. This is a snowfall accumulation graph for Champaign. Normal is right here along this line. We had a snowfall deficit. We were not near normal. But we had a rainfall in excess. So warmth is the big signal. But sometimes we could get uh, more rain. But remember, typically El Nino years, far less than average snowfall. So there you go. Illinois, warm with less snow when there's a big El Nino. Now, what does uh, what do we expect to get if there's a La Nina? Well, when there's a La Nina, we tend to get the opposite. Illinois tends to be cold and have a lot more snow. That's because the jet stream goes into a huge ridge in the Gulf of Alaska and plunges into a deep trough more often than not here across uh, the central part of the United States. You can see it's wetter typically in the northwest, dry basically from the four corners in Southern California all the way over to Florida, but tends to be very stormy in the Ohio River Valley. 
Now let's take a look at this. We looked back, looking at all these El Nino events back to 1950, and look at how each one of them correlated with a temperature pattern. If you just kind of blur your eyes and look at this, you can see that most of them had something like you see right here. It was warm down here with cold plunging in this direction. That's pretty typical of La Nina, which is what you just saw in the previous graph. What about precipitation? Well, a lot of these events tend to produce quite a bit of precipitation through the Ohio River Valley, which is right in through here. You can see several of them are doing that. It's not a slam dunk. It's not a guarantee, but that's at least, excuse me, that's at least what the correlation looks like. So here you go. 2010. See the cold anomalies here? Remember, El Ninos are warm. La Ninas, right in here, are cool ocean temperatures. What happened? Well, December 2010 through February 2011, when this La Nina happened, look at the cold air through a big section of the country. We had our 21st coldest winter on record. That record goes uh, 124 years now. We also had 41 inches of snow. Normally, we have 26 inches of snow in Champaign. So La Ninas for us tend to give us colder and snowier winters. So let's review what we've learned. When it comes to <clears throat> when it comes to the Atlantic, El Nino, fewer hurricanes, more wind shear. La Nina, uh, more hurricanes, less wind shear. Midwest, El Nino, warm winters. La Nina, cold and potentially snowy winters. So we're just picking a few regions out here. So this is what the La Nina looked like last fall. Now check this out. Now this is quite interesting. So this is, this, I'm sorry, uh, November 27th, 2017. Look at this. What we ended up getting was this weak El Nino event. See it here, the warmth plunging into a La Nina. So weak El Nino in each one of the regions going into La Nina. Oranges, warmer than normal. Blues, cooler than normal. So this is El Nino going into La Nina. Got it? What happened? Well, the forecast for last winter, because I'm recording this uh, here in, in, in July of 2018, was to have this region right in through here in La Nina. See it? We see that on average, our ocean temperatures were below the zero line. It was not expected to be a strong La Nina, which is where you get down maybe a degree and a half below normal, but this was certainly a weak La Nina we had for much of our winter. This is just another way of looking at it. Cooler than average ocean temperatures in this area. Well, this is what the forecast was, and here's the verification. Just like we learned, jet stream tends to do this, right? Plunging into a deep trough. The forecast was for cooler than average winter in this area. It was also forecast to be dry along the southern states and wet all in through here. What did we get? Well, we got a near average with a slight cool bias on it for winter. Great forecast based on La Nina was wet right in through this area, which is what we typically see. Also wet in parts of Montana, getting into parts of the Great Plains. This is very characteristic of a La Nina. So using it as our major predictor for last winter was pretty good. But as you're gonna learn, using El Nino or La Nina as your only predictor is not smart. You see, I'm spending this whole lecture talking about this one big thing, El Nino or La Nina. I'm neglecting to tell you there are 12 other global circulations that we watch all the time. El Nino La Nina is just the biggest one, but we have several other that we have to pay attention to. And this is what I want you to get. If it's winter, yeah, we can use El Nino La Nina as a good indicator as to maybe what the weather patterns are going to set up like, but don't use it in summer. I'm showing you two maps. What you got over here is a map on the left, which is showing the correlation between El Nino La Nina and summer precipitation for us in July. And uh, I'm sorry, summer temperatures in July, that's on the left. And on the right, summer precipitation. The correlation coefficients are practically zero for the Midwest. What that means is we can't use El Nino and La Nina in summer to forecast. In winter, we can, but not in summer because the correlations are so low. In winter, they get up to around 0 0.3, 0 0.4, which makes it a little bit more usable. But remember, El Nino is just one piece of the puzzle. Here's another piece. You've probably heard of the polar vortex, right? The polar vortex is not something that's new on Earth. It's been around since Earth 
has been around, okay? Planets with atmospheres that spin have polar vortices, but this is why you need to care about it. When the polar vortex is strong, now what is it again? It's this wind that kind of circumnavigates the North Pole. There's another one on the South Pole, but we're only looking at the North Pole right now. This wind that circumnavigates the North Pole. When the polar vortex is strong, think of it as though it gives a big giant bear hug to all the cold air that sits over the North Pole and doesn't let it penetrate too far to the South. People like me, this is just another big circulation we watch. So I talked about El Nino, La Nina. Well, the Arctic Oscillation tells me about the strength of the polar vortex. If I wanted to have a really, really warm winter, I want a strong polar vortex. And that's because occasionally we get these sudden stratospheric warming events that weaken the polar vortex and allow the cold air to spill south in these deep troughs like you see right here. And when that happens, we can get major, major colder outbreaks. So quick review, strong polar vortex, warm winter for us. Weak polar vortex, cold winter. So again, it's just another circulation we watch. Now, to finish this up, January 3rd, 2018, had a massive unleashing, unleaching sorry, of the polar vortex. Look at this. For a short time period, right at the beginning of the year, we set all-time record lows in Champaign. The atmosphere plunged into a deep, deep, deep trough. See it there? The West Coast, huge ridge. West Coast, warm. Eastern half of the country, very cold. Now, why did this deep trough emerge? Well, the depth of this trough extends all the way up into the stratosphere. You see, this is the polar vortex. Normally, when it sits and spins very tightly right here in this one concentrated area over the North Pole, we stay warm. But it elongated, I'll pause this, it elongated out like this and stretched into this deep plunging trough that brought cold air all the way from Siberia into the Midwest. And when that happens, the Arctic Oscillation goes deep into its negative phase, and we get some temporary, very, very cold air. Now, what's the take-home point from this whole lecture? Well, certainly I want you to understand the circulation of an El Nino La Nina. I want you to remember that El Nino's warm ocean waters over the Pacific, La Nina's cold ocean waters over the Central Pacific. But I want you to remember, there are other circulations that can dominate our weather. And as a meteorologist, we have to look at all of them all the time. That's why I said my job is trying to predict the future behavior of a nonlinear chaotic system. And by the way, the motions of that system span 18 orders of magnitude. Predicting the weather is hard and it is the work of the most sophisticated and powerful computers on earth. And we can still only be accurate with our forecasts out just a few days. We're getting better and better and better as we research and understand these global circulations like El Nino and La Nina in the Arctic Oscillation. I hope you found this lecture fascinating because these big weather systems, they're often the parent system from all of the severe weather types we've discussed throughout the semester. But with that, we'll go ahead and finish up this lecture on El Nino and La Nina.